What a blessing and what an honor. What a privilege to be here, invited by the Palestine Center to talk about my very, very dear friend and brother, Edward Zaid. I want to salute first the leadership of this grand institution, the Jerusalem Fund, and all the various activities associated with the branches and institutions. My new friend and brother, Dr. Ali, thank you so very, very much. And similarly so for my new sister, Zaina Zahm, and also Sister Samara al Qasim has been very important facilitating my coming. And any time I get a chance to talk about a close friend who happened to be the greatest public intellectual in the American empire in the latter part of the 20th century, who happened to be Palestinian too, that cuts against the grain in the history of the USA. But also anytime I get a chance to speak out against any crime against humanity, and I do consider the vicious Israeli occupation, the precious Palestinians as a crime against humanity. It's, it's, an, it's, it's a moral issue. I speak as a revolutionary Christian, so it's a moral issue, it's a spiritual issue. I think any occupation, be it Tibet under the Chinese, if it were Jews under anybody, I would be here too. It's a moral and spiritual issue. And this is what America and the world need to come to terms with. You all have a sense of what happened at the UN yesterday with the raising of the flag, trying to keep visible the plight and predicament of a significant slice, a crucial slice of humanity, Palestinians. But we live in a world in which Palestinian lives matter so little. Just like I come from a people in the belly of the American empire in which red lives matter so little, black lives matter so little, poor people's lives matter so little. And it was precisely this common ground that brought Brother Edward Zaid and myself together. It was 1977 that I first met Edward Zaid. I wanted to attend his lecture. I had read his masterpiece, Beginnings. I had already read his Harvard dissertation on Joseph Conrad and the fiction of autobiography. I had read it in the library. We had written it under Harry Levine. Harry Levine was one of the founders of comparative literary studies in the history of the United States. He actually was a Jewish brother from Omaha, Nebraska. But he headed Comp Lit. Edward had worked with Harry Levine, of course, coming out of Princeton undergrad and studying with Arthur Zathmary and the great Blackmer, Richard Blackmer, one of the finest literary critics. Never went to college, but a college went through him. A professor at Princeton with just a high school degree. That's very rare. I mean, that's who Edward studied with when he went to, went to Princeton. But I had to meet this Edward Zaid because I could tell he was a dynamo. I was 23 years old. And he was, at that time, he was 42. He was born in 1935, I think November the 1st, 1935. And I was in no way disappointed. He was lecturing on Georg Lukács' history in class consciousness. And then he'd move to Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks. Then he'd move back to Flaubert's sentimental education, and he would move back to his favorite, Joseph Comrade again. And right after the lecture, I said, my, uh, the, the, the lecture, I said, my brother, we need to spend some time together. <laughs> so I'm a cognac man. What do you drink? And he was so kind. He realized now, 23 years old, black brother, New York City, straight from Cambridge, Palestinian brother teaching. 
we came together and we remain together. I recall when he sent me the manuscript of Orientalism, I said, you've written a masterpiece, but I'm still listening for the voices of the dominated. You're too obsessed with the dominators. You come from an education that looks top down. I come from an orientation that's bottom up. I want to know what the counter voices are, the counter forces are in the constitution of this deeply dehumanizing discourse called Orientalism that would devalue and demean the rich humanity and decency of those constituted outside of the West as Orientals on the east side of the globe. He said, I appreciate that critique, brother. I got another book coming. The question of Palestine, yes. Covering Islam, yes. Let's get into it. Hear the counter voices after the last sky, the counter voices, so that anytime we talk about the structures that subordinate, we want to hear the agency of those who are reacting and responding in such a way that those structures are always contingent, tentative, provisional, and therefore subject for transformation. Now, he, he told me, so, well, you know, Noam Chomsky wrote me a letter very similar like that. He was very critical of that text. <laughs> and I still have Brother Edwards' letter to me, and I say this not in order to somehow elevate uh, myself in relation to him. I'm, I'm just a... Uh, a fellow freedom fighter. We don't compete with each other. I come from the black tradition that says lift every voice, whatever your voice is. But it's only your voice like your fingerprint. It is distinctively and uniquely yours. And Edward Said had a very distinctive and unique voice. He was the last great humanist intellectual in the American empire. And by humanist, what I mean is those who go back to the legacy of, the, of Athens on the one hand, Jerusalem on the other, and begin with what the Latins call humando, echoes of the 12th paragraph of Vico's The New Science at third edition in 1744-5, not that first one, where Vico says, humanistic studies begins with humando, and humando in Latin means burying and burial. And the very act of burying, which is a displacement that generates mourning, and the need for the ob objectifying of grief connected to memory, which is tied to language. But first and foremost, guttural cries, wrenching moans, and visceral groans that are transfigured into language. And here our Jewish brothers and sisters are very helpful. There's a wonderful moment in the Talmud where they say the fundamental human responses to deep suffering is first tears, then silence, then song. And it's no accident that for Vico, the first human language was poetic language linked to music. And Edward, of course, the great musician that he was, classical musician that he was, he played beautiful Brahms, beautiful Beethoven. Unbelievable. And his writings, musical elaborations, wonderful text on the limits of music. He was very attentive to this issue of hermando. How do we, featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, that's who we are. How do we deal with suffering in our brief move? from our mother's womb to tomb. Short trek, trying to come to terms with our sense of what it means to 
be human. And so for Edward Zaid, as a humanist intellectual, following Vico, but, but going back to Athens and specifically going back to Socrates, Socrates was a hero for my dear brother Edward Zaid. Because Socrates embodied the willingness to interrogate, to criticize, to call into question the most fundamental assumptions and presuppositions of his time. And that's also what Edward wanted to do. Socrates says philosophy itself is a meditation on and preparation for death. Philo, Sophia, love of wisdom, philosophy. A lover of wisdom is one who is preparing for wrestling with forms of death. But as a humanist intellectual, Edward Zaid understood that you have to learn how to die in order to learn how to live. Here he follows Seneca. He or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. Freedom is fundamental for Edward Zaid, but it's not abstract. Like Vico, it begins with the grave, the body, the songs of the group, the souls expressed given the brief move from womb to tomb. So when Edward talks about humanist critiques of narrow forms of humanism, when Edward talks about I am one fundamentally committed to the dictum of Terence, himself a slave, that says nothing human is alien to me. And as an intellectual, going back to modern times with the Russians, over against the powers that be, going back to France and the Dreyfus affair, going against the powers that be like a Emile Zola, he says, I am going to be an intellectual like Socrates that says, echoing line 38A, the unexamined life is not a life of the human. And from 24A of that same dialogue of Plato's Apology, when Socrates says, my unpopularity is caused by parhesia. What is parhesia? Frank speech. Plain speech, fearless speech, unintimidated speech. And for Edward Zaid, my dear brother, your dear brother, he took that seriously. He said, I am going to so thoroughly examine and interrogate myself, my society, my world, the structures of domination, the forms of oppression, but also the structures of feeling, what sets of prejudices and presuppositions are at work. Because anytime you give up assumption, presupposition, anytime you give up a dogma or a dogma or doctrine, it's a form of death. And that's why humanism is so inseparable from what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E deep education, different than the cheap schooling that's so pervasive these days. Because cheap schooling just market-driven skill acquisition, and no, oh, no. Paideia is about learning how to die, giving up certain assumptions and presuppositions and letting them go so that you undergo transformation to be, become more mature, more cultivated, more politically awakened, more spiritually sensitive, more morally courageous. And these are the kind of things that Brother Edward and I talked about over cognac. And, uh, I won't tell you what he was drinking, but we both liked it. <laughs> But this is serious talk, because when you look at his social position, what does it mean to be a Palestinian in the Ivy League, coming out of Princeton in 1957, PhD from Harvard 1964, going to Columbia University in 64, having friends like Lionel Trilling, and a host of others who will help facilitate your tenure and at the same time being true to who you are and still deeply in solidarity with those who are suffering beginning with your own people. 
Not stopping there, but beginning there. It's so easy to be assimilated outsiders, Palestinian, black, brown, red, women, and love everybody but your own people. That might guarantee some success. And I love Brother Edward Zaid's commitment. He was never satisfied with being successful. He was concerned about what he would be faithful to. How would he use his success in such a way that he could embark on frank speech and unintimidated speech that would attempt to tell the truth. And as one of his other heroes put it in the early part of negative dialectics at Theodore Adorno, Adorno says the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Four humanists, beginning with burial, linked to learning how to die into life, but be faithful unto death in the quest for truth to allow the voices of those who are rendered invisible to be heard. And it is in the early 60s that Edward writes his first reflections on, on Arab predicament, journalism. But he's still very much tied toward, as you can imagine, his profession, his blessed family. And we sh should say a word about Hilda and uh, Wadi, his mother and father. I don't like to talk about figures without talking about their mamas and their daddies since they played a role, you know what I mean? Brother Edward wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Sister Hilda, his mama, and Brother Y.D., his father, you see. But you can imagine throwing that brilliant young Palestinian boy into U.S. circumstances in the 50s and 60s. What will be the result? Edward Zaid decides. He's going to be a humanist intellectual. That's not some cheap title. It's something to be earned, just like Socrates. But Edward also knows that the legacy of Socrates associated with Athens has its own limits. The intellectual integrity of Socrates inspires Edward Said. But Socrates never cries, he never sheds a tear. And anybody who's never cried and never shed a tear has never really loved concrete human beings. Clashes with Vico. Socrates loves wisdom in the abstract. He doesn't love concrete persons. It's like Hamlet. He doesn't love others suffers the spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation. Edward's connection with the legacy of Jerusalem begins with tears. It begins with Nakba. It begins with catastrophe. It begins with domination. It begins with internalized mis-self-perceptions among Palestinians themselves. Vis-a-vis -vis other Arabs, vis-a-vis -vis themselves, vis-a-vis -vis Israelis. Clarity, intellectual clarity wedded to tears. And tears do what? Shatter the numbness. Tears do what? Reorient the soul. That's what we love about the legacy of Jerusalem. That's what many of us love about Hebrew scripture. It begins with tears and cries of an oppressed people vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Pharaoh and a covenant that says you are to be human at your best when you do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. When you let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream for all of the nations. That's the beginnings of a legacy of Jerusalem that says the world is to be looked at through the lens of the orphan and the widow and the fatherless and the motherless, the oppressed, those Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. It's a very different orientation, a very different angle of vision of that of Socrates. And Edward Zaid, 
the highly westernized brother that he was. And we can talk about this in question and answer. Because I meet a lot of young folk these days, you know, and they, they say, well, that Brother Edward Zaid, uh, he was uh, influenced a bit by the West. I said, a bit? <laughs> Brother Edward Zaid was westernized through and through, through and through, but he had a magnificent Palestinian difference. And we can write a dissertation on that, though. <laughs> It wasn't completely subsumed under the West, but he was so deeply rooted in the West, and he taught Western humanities every year of his nearly 40 years when he was there at Columbia, and I was also blessed to teach both of his children at Princeton. Sister Naja and Brother Wadi, and the instructions they received from their father was that of a highly Westernized Palestinian brother. Of course, Sister Mary and his wife, she brought in her wisdom to help create a balance. But my point is this, Athens on the one hand, Jerusalem on the other, beginning with tears, beginning with the angle of vision from the vantage point of the oppressed, but most importantly, allowing the expression of fearless speech to be said on behalf of oppressed people. What does that mean for a Palestinian in the 1960s and 70s? What's going on in the world? Well, you can imagine, Soviet empire on the one hand, American empire on the other, Europe, the age of Europe is over. Europe is now a divided continent in the 40s, dependent on either the Soviet empire or the American empire. The Middle East is undergoing transformation. Anti-colonial sensibilities are spreading. Africa's undergone decolonization. It is a different social configuration that is taking place, and it is one in which freedom and liberation are not just slogans. People are willing to live and die. In the United States, American apartheid is being resisted with unbelievable courage, with lynchings and murders and so forth and going so on, but they keep coming, which is to say what? And this is where Marcus Garvey is very important. You all remember Marcus Garvey's rallies? He always would have at the beginning of the rally, the Negro is not afraid. Even if they're sitting there shaking, even if they're shaking sometimes, the Negro is not afraid. Why is that important? Because in the Middle East, in Africa, in other parts of the world, the oppressed people begin to straighten their backs up and say, we have broken the back of fear. We're willing to tell the truth about our suffering. We're willing to organize and mobilize. We're willing to die. We're willing to go to jail. We're willing to stay in the streets. We are not satisfied. It was becoming well-adjusted to injustice. That's called a hot moment. It's hard to imagine. We've been living in an ice age for 35 years. The neoliberal epoch is an ice age for most of the world, which is not to say that there hasn't been magnificent waves of resistance, collective and otherwise, in the West Bank and other places. But those are the pockets. But Edward Zaid is coming of age in a hot moment not just in the States, but around the world. And what is most significant is he is willing to make the connection between what is going on in the American empire. The American empire is center stage, uncontested world power. Only the Soviet empire in some ways competitive, in other ways very uncompetitive. And trying to reshape the whole globe in its image and for its interest, primarily corporate interest. And Edward Zaid says what? He says, oh, but there's a people locked into a settler colonial experiment. It's complicated because it's one of precious Jewish brothers and sisters who jump out of the burning buildings of Jew-hating Europe, but they land on the backs of some Arabs and they act as if these Arabs don't exist. They act as if there's land but no people, but that's a lie. That's a lie. And so the, the, 
And the world is emerging in such a way that who can deny the depths of the evil and the suffering of millions of Jewish brothers and sisters in barbaric and bestial modern civilized Europe. The land of Beethoven and Goethe and Brahms and Sch Schleiermacher and Nietzsche and so forth. No, Hitler is for real. So they land on the backs of these people and their humanity is rendered invisible. And it was he says, no, the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. We got to ensure that their voices, both from the grave and from the quick, has a role and place in this historical moment. And I could speak for hours about the depth and scope of his courage. The death threats. Each time you go to his office, you got bodyguards because they're trying to kill him in his office at Columbia University. We marching against the New York Times. We're talking about this in 1982 with the ugly invasion of Lebanon. The New York Times wouldn't even use the word occupation. Oh no, that's ideologically biased. Please. <laughs> Step by step by step, we now look back, and there's no doubt that we're still in a very, very difficult and nightmare situation when it comes to precious Palestinian brothers and sisters here and in the diaspora in so many ways. But in those days, it was the dark ages, and Edward was a Socratic and a prophetic light. And he does it in the context of the academy, of literary studies, literary criticism. And he says, we must be committed to secular criticism. And by secular, all he meant was mustering the will, the heroic will, to be contra any method, any system, any orientation, any school of thought that thinks it has a monopoly on truth, especially when it is rendering the voices of oppressed people invisible or marginal. By secondly, he had to fight against the post-structuralists, the Foucaults and the Daddy Dolls and Deleuze and others. People would run around and think, Edward Zaid is a postmodernist. No, that's not true. He's calling into question human will. He's calling into question human volition. That's not true. He's using any insights he can from any form of intellectual weaponry, be it Deleuze, Derrida, or Foucault. But he's got his own trajectory, and it is one of a radical humanist intellectual trajectory. Same would be true in terms of his talk about worldly criticism. You always begin with the complex circumstances. You always begin with being situated so you no know formal system will make sense of the lived experience of persons. There's no algorithm, there's no f framework that is deodorized that can do justice to the funk of everyday people's struggles. That's why he loved C.L.R. James, because James's Marxism was always tempered by that which didn't fit. That's what he loved about Adorno, the cross grains that are not subsumable under any system, what the Greeks call a topos, the unclassifiable things. And that's one of his reasons why he remained distant from Marxism. He and I had long discussions about this because Edward Zaid had a way of lecturing about Antonio Gramsci for an hour and a half. And you'd never know Gramsci was a Marxist. He just called him counter-hegemonic <laughs> in opposition. I said, well, he's more than that now. He's a communist now, brother. <laughs> Well, that's not important, Brother Wesley. Well, it is important. He got a class analysis here. <laughs>
but, his, but his formation was one in which he was always suspicious because his conception of Marxism was one as a method and a system, and his conception of secular criticism is to hold all methods and systems at arm's length, to be flexible and fluid enough to keep track of what is true to the lived experience of people who are struggling and at the same time ensure that those oppressed people are self-critical too. And we can talk about his critiques of the PLO, his struggles with Yasser Arafat, his willingness to take a stand in the Palestinian context and ensure that self-criticism held across the board, even if that made him unpopular among Palestinians themselves, even as he's living under death threat in the American hegemon. Boy, that's a special brother. Very, very special brother indeed. He and I had deep struggles over popular culture, and I think when we, when we talk about Edward Zaid and all of his genius and all of his capacious imagination, there are a number of blind spots. I want to just note one or two before we move into the present situation. That Edward Zaid had a certain um, disparaging view of popular culture. He was a highbrow radical humanist. <laughs> he thought Adorno was right about jazz, which upset me deeply. Adorno had a very, very negative view about jazz. He didn't see the genius bubbling up from Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan and John Coltrane and Miles Davis but the jazz that he was talking about was Glenn Miller, so I could understand. <laughs> you just have to be very mindful of which particular slices of jazz you're talking about. Somebody write a dissertation on Kenny G and say jazz is not worth spending a lot of time. I understand, okay, fine. Listen to a little Coltrane, straighten you out. But it was popular culture in general, and this is very interesting, because really it was the first time I saw Edward embrace popular culture when he wrote about Palestinian culture. You can't write about after the last guy. You can't write about the poetry. You can't write about the songs unless you immerse yourself in not just highbrow humanist culture, but the genius that's flowing from below as well. And I tried to catch him on this. He said, well, I'm talking about Palestine. I'm not talking about America. Because he followed the door. No, America's about mass culture. Popular culture is mass culture, manipulated from above, market-driven, tied to instant gratification, body stimulation, and titillation. And he's right about much of American popular culture, but that's not all of it. That's not all of it. But the challenge is, especially with the younger generation, this was a challenge that he had for the younger generation, who have been so shaped by popular culture. How will you connect with them if your discourse is centered on Jane Austen and Flaubert and Gramsci and Kafka and T.S. Eliot and does not in any way have something to say about the popular artists of the day? It could be a Bob Dylan or a Carole King. It could be Gil Scott Heron or The Last Poets or the Cornell West theory these days. We got Brother Tim Hicks, who's one of the leaders of the Cornell West theory. And I say that not because they named it the group after me, but because they are telling some musical truths from the bottom up with Mumia Abu Jamal and Angela Davis and others on the album, making that connection. It's a challenge for Edward Zaid's legacy. Very difficult challenge, it seems to me. And at the same time, given the changes that have taken place uh, since he died, September 2003, both in the United States as well as in the Middle East, you see, how do we keep his legacy alive? Speaking truth to power, self-critically, bearing witness, 
tied to the most sophisticated analysis of the day, of the economy, of culture, but also of self-transformation. Edward was in no way hermetic or privatistic, but he was deeply individualistic in terms of style and sometimes very lonely and isolated. But how do you keep his legacy alive in a moment in which the market now saturates every nook and cranny of our culture? including the academy, with the corporatizing, commercializing, and marketizing taking place in the academy. Very different kind of academy that, that Edward Zaid was a part of. In a culture in which everything is for sale, everybody's for sale. Not just here, but in the Middle East too. The need, the muster, the courage to think critically, the courage to empathize, the courage to organize, the courage to hope, more and more difficult in such a market-saturated society, empire, and world. And then the other blind spot of Edward Zaid, which is that of religion. You can tell by his name, Edward. He's named after the Prince of Wales, Edward VIII. It was very popular in 1935 when he was born. <laughs> he grew up Episcopalian. The grandfather who was a Baptist missionary. He married a Quaker. His own formation vis-a-vis -vis religion was one that he pushed back in regard to any religious identity and affiliation. But in the most market saturated moment in the history of the species, our moment, is, always, is also the moment in which religious revivals escalate and intensify. And therefore, an analysis of both market and religion, which go hand in hand, are necessary. But Edward himself, secular, and when it came to religion, religion usually meant for him blind dogma. And I would tell him over and over again, my dear brother, you're wrong. You're wrong. See, Malcolm X was a revolutionary Muslim because he grew mature. He learned how to die in order to learn how to live. He called in the question dogma and doctrine and remained a Muslim. Martin Luther King Jr. called in the question dogma, doctrine elements of himself, but he remained a revolutionary Christian. Bell Hooks, revolutionary Buddhist, we can go on and on. And Edward would always tell me, see, Brother West, 95% of what you and I do together convinces me that you're thoroughly secular. I said, no, brother, I'm a Jesus-loving free black man. Now, don't. Don't try to subsume me under your secular project. <clears throat> and I just had a quick footnote. When we got the call in September 1991 that they had leukemia, and we cried tears, and I called him up. I said, my brother, I'm going to bring some prayer warriors to your house. James Forbes, one of the greatest preachers and pastors of the 20th century, pastor of Riverside, Church, James Melvin Washington, the editor of A Testament of Hope, Martin Luther King Jr.'s writings. The three of us went straight to Edward's place and we prayed in his living room. And he, and he allowed us to pray. And I told my brother, you got to get in on this. <laughs> and Marion said, I think that's a good idea, Edward. And it was quite a moment the radically secular Edward Zaid, with three Jesus-loving free black men. And he knew he was about to love because we loved him. He expressed the yearning. September 1991, he dies. 2003, that's 12 years. We don't know whether the prayers contributed to the 12 years or not. <laughs> Probably not, but you never know. 
I've been praying for the elimination of poverty in the world. God doesn't hear it. <laughs> but it was a solidarity felt. And it was the affirmation of his vocation, of his calling as radical humanist intellectual, telling America about the truth of its relation to a settler colonial experiment like America itself being initially a settler colonial experiment, losing sight of the people in the land, saying there's no people in that land. And sooner or later, truth crushed the earth will rise again. The voices will be heard. Chickens come home to roost. You're going to reap what? your soul. There was a parallel. You see. And Edward understood it. Where does that leave us now? First, more than anything else, I want to end with this quote from the great W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was at the end of his life. He'd been in handcuffs in the U.S. courts claims that somehow he was connected to the Soviet Empire. This is the height of the Cold War, McCarthyism. He lived at 31 Court Street in Brooklyn Heights, in the greatest bureau in the world, Brooklyn. And he had one visitor who was, who was the most popular Negro in the world in 1939, but he was under house arrest in Philadelphia. His name was Paul Robeson. There was only two meet. And the boy says, I've got to send a love letter to the world to come to terms with four questions. He embarked on the writing of a trilogy of three novels. The first novel is called The Ordeal of Manzar. He turned to page 275 in that novel. And the boy says, first question, how shall integrity face oppression? I've been wrestling with that, intellectual integrity, moral integrity, spiritual integrity, political integrity. The second question, what does honesty do in the face of deception? And we know we live in a world of such massive mendacity and criminality of lies and crimes that are cast as normal. And we are told to be indifferent toward it. The third question, what does decency do in the face of insult? And the last query, what does virtue do to meet brute force? Edward Zaid, the best sense of the radical humanist intellectual tradition exemplified an integrity in the face of oppression. His whole life. Intellectual integrity, moral integrity. Integrity is not purity. Integrity is not being always right. It's what Jane Austen called constancy. And Edward has a fascinating essay on Jane Austen. It's dialectical it's a critique, but constancy, having the courage of your convictions regardless of the cost, to take a risk. Honesty, sheer intellectual honesty. Bernard Lewis quit lying. It's partly what he was saying. No matter how much erudition you got, the bias, the tilt, the hermeneutical orientation that you have loses sight of the humanity of Arabs and Palestinians in a significant way. Quit lying and be honest. Hermeneutics of honesty. Edward Zaid tried to be honest. Decency in the face of insult. All of the various narratives and analyses we see it today. Can you imagine 500 babies being killed in 50 days and there not being a wave of righteous indignation in every corner of the country or globe? It's indecent that that could take place and there not be those kinds of waves of moral outrage and holy anger. Zaid says, honesty in the face of insult. 
You're disrespecting the folk to have that kind of relative silence given the dominance of certain conceptions of what's going on in the Middle East that allows the Israeli defense forces to do what they want in the name of self-defense. No, there's some moral limits. No, there's some ethical constraints. And there's some imbalance and asymmetry of power and domination when you're talking about the clash of those peoples. And last but not least, last but not least, virtue in the face of brute force. The Zaid very much like those of us in the black freedom movement, we understood that when you talk about intellectual work, it's never just academic and abstract. Because when you take a stand, you better be willing to die because the repressive apparatus of the nation states coming at you will generate not just character assassination, but actual assassination, brute force. Something that's hard for many of our mainstream liberal and neoliberal intellectuals to come to terms with because brute force is not part of their world. When I'm told there's over a thousand white supremacist militia groups operating in America, and my name happens to be on half of them, that's not an abstract issue. My mama loves me. When Zaid had to deal with the vicious attacks and threats, that's not an abstract issue. Miriam, Cornell, Naja, Wadi loved him. We stand right with him because we loved him. That's what we're talking about. That's what Du Bois is talking about. That is part of the undeniable greatness. And by greatness, I don't mean Alexander the Great. I don't mean Napoleon. I don't mean Julius Caesar. I'm saying he or she is greatest among you who attempt to serve in the form of the gifts that they have such that truth-telling and witness-bearing can be a force for real good, to use the language of John Coltrane in the short time that we are here. And that's what is so magnificent about our brother, our comrade, our grand intellectual friend, Edward Zaid. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. And thank you, Brother West, for this most eloquent tribute to Dr. Edward Said. I am sure that he is smiling. I also thank you for your expressions of solidarity with the Palestinian people. I don't think that anyone could have paid tribute to Edward Said better than you have done. I don't think that anybody can articulate the solidarity with the Palestinians in this, at this particular time than you have done so. Thank you again. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. It was amazing. Um, what part of Edward Said's work actually influenced the way that you um, write academically or teach, and in what ways has he influenced your general work? Thanks. Oh, thank you for the kind words. Though. It's, it's so many aspects of his work. I should mention some texts for people who are interested in going back to read Zaid. These are texts that I go back and read and reread. Uh, uh, I mentioned Beginnings of 1975, which is still a magnificent work, especially that last chapter on Vico. Vico. Uh, the World, the Text, and the Critic is probably one of the best introductory uh, texts to read, the 12 essays in that work. The Wreath Lectures, the representation of the intellectual that he gave right in the midst of unbelievable controversy in Europe. He had been disinvited to the Freud Lecture at roughly the same time. Culture and Imperialism is his magnum opus, uh, a powerful work. Uh, 
the question of Palestine still, uh, uh, it, it's, it moves me so as well as after the last sky. But I mentioned the work on music, musical elaborations is crucial. His last works, uh, the work on the late style is worth reading and the essay on Glenn Gould, you know Glenn Gould, the, the piano virtuoso. It, it's very rare that you get a humanist intellectual who uses a musician as the model of what a virtuos, uh, 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 an, an intellectual enacting virtuosic activity is, and Edward, of course, being a pianist, but it's a fascinating read of Glenn Gould, Glenn Gould in that work. And then the, uh, it's a little text called uh, Humanism and Democratic, what's the name of it? Anybody remember that little book? Humanism and Democratic Criticism, that's what it is. And I was surprised because Edward usually held at arm's length American culture. He wrote one essay introducing Herman, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, but he tended to talk about European comparative literature. Whereas in this text, he's talking about American thinkers. Very, very important because he's not just coming home in the sense of New York, Columbia University, but it's the USA. Uh, so all of those texts I read and reread, I really do. And um, I teach, I've taught in prison for 37 years, and I always include my brother Edward Zaid's text for the brothers, always. An essay now, because you know Edward can be prolix in the language sometime for, <laughs> for, for everyday folk. But that's the kind of brief answer to your question. Thank you very much. Just a question from the right. Hello, Brother West. How you doing, my brother? I'm good, good, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed to be here, man. So I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to hear you speak a few years ago at Tufts University, and you spoke about black prophetic tradition. Yeah. Um, and this past year, I had the pleasure, well, not the pleasure, but the duty to go to Ferguson, um, yeah. and ended up actually working with um, one of your colleagues, Reverend Seku, out of Boston. Oh, yeah. And in doing so, I was thinking tonight during your talk about the relevance of the black prophetic tradition and how it plays into activism nowadays, um, specifically with Black Lives Matter and organizations around the United States. With respect to this talk, and since we're discussing Edward Said's legacy, how has his work informed your activism within the United States, and how do you think it should inform the way that we organize in communities right now in the United States in the belly of the empire? Yeah, I appreciate both the question, but also I'm glad you invoked Brother Sekou, because he's one of the... Uh magnificent prophetic uh, revolutionary Christians of our, of our day. And he works there with Tef Poe and uh, a whole host of uh, uh, activists on the ground with Ned and others. Uh, part of the ice age that I was talking about is the way in which black radicals have either been silenced or put to sleep under a black president because usually the black freedom struggle is the leaven in the American loaf. See, that critique of white supremacy expressing that black rage, willing to organize and mobilize, once that thing expresses itself, lo and behold, women, workers, gay brothers, lesbian sisters, elderly, so wave, oh Lord, we can get in on this too. That's exactly right, because it's for everybody, but it starts on the chocolate side of town. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been the history of the country. That's the history of the country, right? The abolitionists, Fred Douglas and others, take off, and then the suffragists who were in part of the anti-racist movement take off the trade union movement. Why, why is that? Well, there's a lot of historical reasons. Not because black people have a monopoly on truth or goodness or anything, but the particular role of white supremacy in shaping and molding the country is so fundamental that once you hit white supremacy, lo and behold, all of these issues of justice start coming to bear. The same is true in 1965. We look at the country. Look how America has changed since 1965. What was that? That's the Black Freedom Movement that pushed back the White Supremacist Immigration Act in 1921. and said, look, we are fighting white supremacy. We know this immigration is so white supremacist. We want the whole world to come. Now we got a very different and wonderful America as a result of the Black Freedom Movement in that sense. Well. We get a black president. Oh, Lord, nobody want to be critical. Nobody want to tell the truth. Every 28 hours, some black or brown person gets shot by a police security guy. You got black president, black attorney general, black homeland security. Not one policeman goes to jail. Something, something just ain't right. 
Where's the voices? Well, we got to protect the black president. Now the black freedom movement, like Edward in the context of the Palestinians. Arafat, here's the critique, brother. I'm seeing too much unaccountability here. I'm seeing too much irresponsibility here. Don't say that. We fighting the Israeli occupation. I know that, but I'm going to keep you accountable too. Don't use Israeli occupation to somehow hide and conceal your own lack of accountability. Edward had to deal with tremendous antagonism. Of course, you, you know better than I do. Is that right, my brother? Absolutely. And so I said to myself, my God, if he could do that, I could try to keep the president accountable. Be it drones dropping bombs on precious folk in Yemen or Pakistan or Afghanistan. What is it now? 231 children killed by bombs dropped by U.S. drones. And where's the voices? That's a war crime to me. Those are war crimes. I don't care what color the leader is. That's a war crime <laughs> across the board. Let's just tell it the way it is. You know what I mean? Got massive surveillance that... Edward Snowden is laid bare, and we won't even talk about the friendly relations with Wall Street. You know, what does it mean to go into a meeting in March of 2009 and tell the top 13 CEO, you bring a cake and say, I stand between you and the pitchfork of the masses, but I'm on your side, I will protect you. No, that's not Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer. You go to the poor children and the working people and say, I will protect you, I will serve you. You don't go to Wall Street and tell them that. And how many, how many Wall Street executives? Massive criminality in 2008 and 2009. Insider trading, market manipulation, predatory lending, on and on and on. How many Wall Street executives go to jail? Less than the number of Negroes in the National Hockey League. <laughs> you know, so it's Zaid's spirit that says, Brother West, keep trying to tell the truth. Keep trying to bear witness. You're not in this for a popularity context. You tie the integrity, honesty, and decency. I can hear his voice from the grave. In a secular mode, I still got Jesus, but <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. But that's the beginnings of an answer. And the new marvelous militancy that's not just in Ferguson, but Baltimore, in Los Angeles, in Staten Island, more and more escalating, you know. That's the crucial thing. We got a march in New York, October 24th, Carl Dixon, myself. It's going to be another manifestation of it. It's not a fad. It's not a fashion. It's a way of life. And we're going to be faithful unto death. 